So here's where we left off. We have our sarcoplasmic reticulum loaded with calcium. And through this conformational change through calcium influx, calcium moves into the sarcoplasm. So we see here calcium is leaving through this ryanidine receptor, ultimately into the muscle cell cytoplasm or sarcoplasm. This calcium that's now in the sarcoplasm is going to lead us to cross-bridge cycling and the sarcomere. Now the sarcomere is the functional unit of the muscle. Okay? So when a muscle shortens, a muscle is the sum of its part, and so when the muscle shortens you're going to have to have thousands, millions of sarcomeres shortening at the same time. And so these are going to be the events for one sarcomere, but of course this is going to be happening universally throughout that muscle. And in the sarcomere, we have several proteins, four in fact, that we need to understand. First of all, we have actin. Now, actin is composed of a bunch of little monomers, but I'm just showing this actin here in blue, right? So this is actin. It composes the thin filaments. Down here is myosin. Myosin is going to be part of the thick filaments, all right? It's also worth noting that myosin is going to be an ATPase, meaning it can bind ATP and then also hydrolyze it into ADP. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but this is myosin. Also, these white circles on the actin, these are going to be myosin binding sites. So in order to shorten the sarcomere and therefore have muscle contraction, myosin will actually have to bind to these binding sites on actin. And as of right now, they're not bound. And the reason they're not bound at rest is because this red protein that's called tropomyosin is covering these binding sites. And I tried to draw this appropriately so that all of these binding sites on actin for myosin are covered up by tropomyosin. Okay? There's another protein, troponin, and troponin's kind of the gatekeeper. Troponin, when it's at rest, kind of holds tropomyosin over these binding sites. So if we want to move the tropomyosin, we have to do something to the troponin, right? Now, troponin is a calcium binding protein. So when we influx the sarcoplasm with lots of calcium, some of this calcium is going to come over and bind to troponin, which I've shown right here. We see this calcium ion over here, this one over here is bound to troponin. And when calcium binds to troponin, troponin is going to rotate tropomyosin off of these binding sites. So notice how I've done this. I've rotated the tropomyosin such that it's no longer over these binding sites for myosin on the actin. Okay? And that is going to allow these myosin heads to actually now interact with this binding site on actin. And this process that I've just shown of the myosin heads binding to the actin, this is called cross bridge formation. And in order to have sarcomere shortening and muscle contraction, we have to have cross bridge formation. Okay? And so the events here, again, to review, calcium binds to troponin. And then troponin moves that tropomyosin off the myosin binding sites on actin, and that allows the myosin to now come over here and bind to actin. And that is the process of cross-bridge formation. But one thing I want you to notice about the myosin is that in order to form this cross-bridge, myosin has to have ADP bound to it. Okay? So you have to have ADP bound to myosin in order for this cross-bridge to occur. Well, how does myosin get ADP? Well, this is a cross-bridge cycle. This is a process that happens, okay? So it looks a little bit different here, but again, these blue proteins right here, this is the thin filament, and these are actin, okay? And then this right here, this little thing that looks like a golf club, this is the myosin, okay? Now, at the start of this cycle, and you can start anywhere in here, but I'm going to start here, the myosin head has to have bound ADP and phosphate. Now, ADP and phosphate are the products of ATP hydrolysis, and we'll talk about later in the cycle where the ATP comes from. But it suffices to say for now that in order to form the cross bridge, the myosin head has to have bound ADP and phosphate. Okay? So the first step is cross bridge formation. So when these things are bound to the myosin, notice here that it forms the cross bridge. Now actually, it first forms the cross bridge. So first of all, the ADP and phosphate are still bound, and then the myosin binds to actin. Okay? Technically, after that cross bridge forms, the phosphate is released. So notice that here we no longer see that phosphate as denoted by the P. It's gone. 
technically first the crossbridge formation and then the phosphate's released. It turns out that the phosphate release actually tightens this interaction between the myosin head and the actin. But notice that we now have a crossbridge. And then what we're going to see is the power stroke. And so what happens during the power stroke is notice that this myosin head actually is going to rotate. And when it rotates, it's going to move the thin filament. It's ultimately going to move it toward the middle of the sarcomere. And overall, what that means is that we get shortening of the sarcomere. Because this isn't just happening here. It's happening hundreds of thousands of times all along the thick filament. And so you have a bunch of myosin heads that are all pulling on the actin, they're all pulling on this thin filament and moving it toward the what's called the M line of the sarcomere, the middle of it. And overall, when you have all that happening at the same time, you have net shortening of the sarcomere. Now, after the power stroke occurs, the ADP is released. Okay, and there's some dispute. This probably happens around the same time. But overall, power stroke, ADP is released, all right? And now you have uh, this myosin that's still stuck to the actin, okay? So what has to happen in order to cause the myosin head to release from the actin is ATP attaches. So ATP is going to attach to the myosin, and when ATP attaches, it causes cross-bridge breakage. So the cross-bridge is going to break. That means detachment of myosin from the actin. So ATP is going to attach to myosin. Now we have, as we see here, the myosin separate from the actin. And once they're separate, that ATP is going to be hydrolyzed. So ATP is hydrolyzed into ADP and phosphate. And so this ATP hydrolysis cocks or activates this myosin head into its activated high energy conformation. And that's what we see right here. And that's actually where we started the cycle. So when that ATP is hydrolyzed, we get the resulting ADP and phosphate. Now again, in order for that myosin head to form the cross bridge, you have to have ADP and phosphate bound to the myosin head. Okay? But ultimately, that ADP and phosphate that allow the myosin head to attach to the actin, those come from ATP hydrolysis and from an ATP molecule that attached in the previous cycle. Okay? So again, you can start anywhere in here for this cycle. But the key things to remember are that ADP and phosphate allow cross-bridge formation, but then ATP attachment causes cross-bridge breakage, causes detachment of myosin from actin. Okay? And then the ATP hydrolysis activates the myosin head so that you can get another cross-bridge. And this cycle is going to repeat and repeat and repeat as long as you have this calcium in the sarcoplasm. And so when you want to terminate muscle contraction, there's actually several ways that this occurs. One way is that calcium is actually removed from the sarcoplasm, but also from the very beginning here of the video, this acetylcholine actually has to be degraded, and that's through an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. We're going to talk in a separate video about how we terminate a muscle contraction, but for now I'm just going to mention those two things very briefly. Okay? So in a very brief recap of this, we have an action potential moving down the motor neuron axon. That's going to trigger acetylcholine release from these synaptic vesicles into the neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine will bind to acetylcholine receptors, which triggers a local depolarization because of sodium influx and net positive charges here on the inside of the motor end plate. And then that's going to trigger the opening of a voltage-gated sodium channel and another voltage-gated sodium channel, and so on and so forth. And this now action potential going along the muscle cell sarcolemma, that is the membrane, is eventually going to reach the transverse tubule system and go into the, that T-tubule system, where it's going to ultimately trigger calcium to be released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the sarcoplasm. That calcium will then bind to troponin, move tropomyosin off of these binding sites on actin for myosin, and that's going to allow myosin to then interact with actin, which forms the cross bridge. Once that cross bridge happens in the presence of ADP and phosphate, then you're going to get the power stroke. Actin is going to be moved towards the middle of the sarcomere, and you get net muscle shortening, but then ATP has to attach to the myosin, which causes the detachment of myosin from actin. ATP is then hydrolyzed to reactivate myosin into its activated position, and the cycle repeats itself. All right? So, 
Hopefully this video made sense to you and you understand about the process of excitation contraction coupling. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.